I want to start this morning by thanking the workshop organizers, the technical chairs, panel moderators, and especially the, the paper authors who have all worked so diligently to be here for today's workshop. Uh, considering the dramatic pivot everyone has had to make in the last two months, uh, your presence here is uh, no small feat. Uh, special thanks also go to David Nickel from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, uh, the workshop's co-chair and the ultimate answer man. I especially want to recognize this year's IEEE Security and Privacy Conference General Chair, uh, a great friend and colleague, Gabriela Chocarlia from SRI International. I knew that if anyone could pull a team together in these trying times, it would be Gabriela. Um, next, I want to thank all of you, the attendees for here today. Like many of you, I had planned to be in San Francisco this week to discuss this important topic in person, uh, to meet so many of you and to have uh, fabulous conversations uh, in hallways and uh, lunchrooms, et cetera. Um, but as it turns out, uh, coronavirus had a different idea for us. Uh, but this pandemic might become one of the most illustrative examples of the need for a robust and secure supply chain. Over the last couple of months, we've experienced commodity disruptions. This has forced us to examine the fault lines and how we prioritize and procure items ranging from medical supplies, sanitation projects, and even groceries. Um, there were even uh, talks of bacon shortages, and uh, those of you that know me know that that was really a, a severe blow to me. And so the need to be resilient in our personal lives is now a topic of daily conversation. Uh, but here in the United States, there is another recent event that is more directly related to today's workshop. Three weeks ago, President Trump signed an executive order aimed at securing the U.S. bulk electric power grid from foreign cyber threats. While details are still emerging from the announcement, the thing is clear. Supply chain security is now a major driver in how we resource, purchase, and contract for equipment that operates our critical infrastructures. At the same time, modern society functions through a globalized economy. This means we must balance the need for supply chain security with the knowledge that some risk is essential to avoiding supply chain disruptions. The key is to minimize the consequences that bad actors and malicious code can have on our digital systems. This is especially true for computing technology that is sourced supplied and manufactured by dozens of organizations located throughout the world. If anything, the last couple of months have shown us how relevant today's event is going to be. Once again, thank you for attending the Crest Workshop. We're excited to have you all here. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Shar. Thank you, Zachary. Our next speaker is supposed to be is Mark Taranampour. Um, Mark is the Intel uh, Charles E. Young Preeminence Endowed Chair Professor in Cybersecurity at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Florida and an IEEE Fellow. I will turn it over to Mark. Yes, we are. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, uh, appreciate the support that you guys have given me to get ready for for this keynote. Uh, let me first start uh, uh, by thanking um, IEEE SMP, this workshop organizers. Um, it's a topic that is, uh, as Zach mentioned, it's very important, but it's very uh, dear and near to my heart. I've been working on hardware root of trust and uh, supply chain security for the past 15 years. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with you some of my thoughts in this uh, in this topic area. As I mentioned, my name is Mark Taranapur. I'm an Intel and Chair Professor at University of Florida. I'm the director of uh, Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research, but I do have multiple hats. I am director of uh, three new centers that I've been able to establish over the past 18 months at University of Florida. Uh, MES Center, which is focused on microelectronic security training, and uh, Cyan, which focuses on analog, analog emission enabled cybersecurity. And a transition center, which basically we uh, take technologies from the Institute and uh, convert them into commercially available technologies. I'm also president and CTO of Caspia Technologies, a startup focused on developing EDA technologies for microelectronic supply chain. So with that, Emma, let me start with uh, discussing a bit about motivation behind my talk and, and what is hardware root of trust problem within the supply chain that is quite, quite complex. Um, the fact that over the past many, many years of uh, more than two decades that U.S semiconductor and electronics industry has moved offshore. Um, there are no trusted foundries uh, in, in, in US soil today. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the 
recent news, which was very important to hear, but also another news that was um, um, that came out just about a week ago, where TSMC, the largest uh, semiconductor manufacturing foundry in the world, is going to have a facility in Arizona by 2023 or 2025. Um, that will help U.S. government obviously with establishing some sort of a trusted facility or foundry to gain access to the state-of-the-art technology. Um, however, the trend continued over the past two years, even though this is a welcoming news to many, but the security issues will still remain. Um, the fabulous semiconductor companies have grown quite a bit, and there was a time where the top 10 companies they used to be fabulous, were all from the United States. Well, today things have changed, and more and more companies from China, Singapore, Taiwan are making those top 10 because, as I said, the design, manufacturing, assembly, packaging, test, everything, unfortunately, has moved offshore over the past many years. And that brought a significant number of vulnerabilities and attacks. Um, Untrusted foundry continues to be a major concern where foundry can get access to all uh, uh, design data and uh, control on the masks and fabrication process. Trojans and uh, malicious changes that can happen in the integrated intellectual property codes written in various forms of C code or RTL code or gate level or physical design. They can, uh, they can potentially uh, cause uh, catastrophic uh, concerns in the supply chain. Uh, counterfeit issues and counterfeit ICs and counterfeit PCBs have been around for the past two decades and unfortunately counterfeiters are becoming much more sophisticated by day. Physical attacks used to be a difficult one to carry. However, physical attacks and side channel attacks and fault injection attacks have become much, much easier to carry these days. And much of it has to do with the fact that there is a lot of exploit kits available on internet, some even as low as 200 bucks that you can gain access to and then use them to be able to extract keys. Some of the attacks they used to take months and years to carry out, they can take only minutes to do. Reverse engineering, fake parts, etc. These are some of the other important attacks that happen within the supply chain. And the attacks are not just limited to integrated circuits, um, PCBs and better systems, systems and system of systems basically are subject to all sorts of attacks as well. So take a look at the figure on the left, which is a, com a, a cologne version of a commodity item. But the figure in the middle is a genuine versus fake Cisco router. These are the routers that sits on your network and control your data. And if they're fake or cloned, um, they could potentially uh, capture significant uh, uh, sensitive information or also private information from individual home businesses, etc. And the figure on the right shows a genuine versus fake Honda part, which is used in ancient control unit. This is a critical part that one is genuine and the other is counterfeit. The story that made the biggest uh, noise when it comes to electronic supply chain, in my opinion, was the one that was published in Bloomberg News uh, Business Week about 18 months ago, where the, um, the story basically claimed that China was able to infiltrate US uh, uh, critical infrastructures. These are data centers um, you, in, the, in, in, in Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, as well as intelligence uh, agencies, where this is a motherboard designed and fabricated by Supermicro. Supermicro is a Taiwanese company headquartered in Taiwan, but the uh, fabrication facilities are both in Taiwan as well as China. And the claim is that a very small, tiny chip that was actually hidden under another part, which is not, that means it is not easily visible. This part was able to hijack the PC, this, this motherboard during the boot up process by manipulating the firmware and be able to take control of the system. Obviously, uh, some companies came out and Denied this story, even though Bloomberg claimed that they have 17 sources for the story. 
And I get that question a lot uh, because this is an area that I've been working for the past decade or so. And um, whether the story is true and real, and my my answer to that is that um, I don't know whether the story is real, but I can tell that the problem is real. And this is doable because we do that all the time. We develop tests like this all the time and many other researchers as well. So why attacks like this have become so important? One reason is because when the attack is made on hardware, it basically every system that contains that particular chip is also become has become vulnerable. So take an Intel chip as an example. When Intel chip proven to be vulnerable in millions and hundreds of millions, depending on the type of chip, billions of devices are actually subject to that vulnerability. And if you compare it with other type of attacks that we hear pretty much every day, whether it's phishing attacks through social engineering and emails, malwares, ransomwares, viruses and all sorts of Trojans, yes, they are important, but they are at a smaller scale compared to hardware. And what makes it easier to deal with attacks with on the hardware and firmware is because they are patchable. They could be updated and upgraded regularly or if an attack happens, sometimes in a matter of days or sometimes in a matter of hours, the upgrade or update is available. However, when the hardware is under attack, unfortunately, such a patch is not easily or at all available. Therefore, every system needs to be replaced, which means we're talking about months or years to be able to um, replace those systems. And unfortunately, the impact of hardware compromise on businesses are significant. And take example of Intel. When Meltdown and Specre came out, um, Intel lost 8% of its stock on that day. That translates into tens of billions of dollars. When Supermicro story came out to Bloomberg, Supermicro actually lost 46% of its stock in one day. Where when malwares and, and Trojans happen, we do not see just such a reaction within the market toward that kind of a vulnerability that show up pretty much every minute. And if you look at the, what happened with Intel, not only they lost the stock, but also they have also faced a lot of lawsuits because of the negligence perhaps that something that these companies have made toward design of their hardware and so on and so forth. So it's a major issue when it comes to experiencing hardware compromise. So then the question is, how do we go about addressing them? Please keep in mind that uh, not too long ago, when we think about hardware security, when you think about software security and network security, the assumption was that the hardware is secure. Unfortunately, that assumption has been challenged because of the supply chain, because supply chain has become globalized. And when we design our electronic devices and systems, we're basically looking at a large number of entities across the globe that are not necessarily trusted or having certain amount of control on aspects of that design. And that brings a lot of issues with it. So how do we go about addressing it? Well, we need to find a way to establish that root of trust. We need to gain that trust back again. And how do we do that? Well, should we focus on mathematical or, or algorithmic aspects of it or the hardware implementation of it? I'll give you an example of AES. AES was developed around 1990s, mid 1990s. Now, and and so far, it withstood all sorts of attacks when it comes to brute force as well as trying to figure out a way to find vulnerabilities within the, uh, 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 the, the, the math behind it. And it's proven to be quite, quite strong. However, when AES is implemented in a chip, sometimes in a matter of hours, and recently in a matter of minutes, you would be able to actually read secrets from the AES chip, which basically um, tells about how weak certain sometimes the implementations are, while the algorithms are proven to be very, very secure. So why that is the case? Why do we see such weak implementations coming in? Much of it has to do with the fact that those who have designed the algorithms are not the ones who designed the chip, are not, the design, are not those who designed the electronic devices and systems. So designers, unfortunately, are not best educated when it comes to security vulnerabilities. 
The kind of vulnerabilities that we, we deal with are information leakage, side channel leakage, fault injection, tamper, intrusion insertions, and more. And unfortunately, as designs are becoming more and more complex, we see a lot more attack surfaces that are coming out, whether those remote accesses, whether to Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Zigbee, etc., or physical accesses that you have sophisticated equipment that you will be able to put your devices under those equipment in a couple of hours you get access to the key. Once you get access to the key, the system is broken. Or you could basically have connections, but they're not necessarily physical or intrusive in a sense that you can just simply get access to JTAG or debug ports that are readily available, unfortunately, for you to be able to get access to supposedly perform tests and debug, but you could actually cause security vulnerabilities. So how do we address that then? If, if this is the problem, if you're talking about weaknesses in the implementation, how do we address it? So I divide this into three major steps toward addressing our supply chain with life, with life cycle in mind. First is to protect the IP. Intellectual property over the past several years through the previous administration and this administration have been discussed quite a bit. It is a problem. Particular China has become a target of discussions mainly because attacks have been happening from that side of the world quite a bit. This is very important, whether the IP within a foundry environment, whether IP for your design, whether IP for your software must be protected. The second is is to protect the assets. If IP is protected, but assets that are being used within the IP is not protected, which means attacker will be able to gain access to your IP very easily. And the third is that the IP and assets are protected. Let's protect the supply chain. Let's make sure when the chip goes into the supply chain for some of our electronic devices and systems, the last two years or 20 years or, or, or 40 years was some government and military applications could potentially last that long. We make sure that those devices and systems remain secure and the authentication is guaranteed throughout the supply chain at any point of time in their lifetime. So let's start with the protecting IPs. It's a very complex problem. I'm going to give an example of what we do and what community has been doing quite, quite a bit on how to protect IP. And one of the techniques, especially when it comes to protecting IPs, it, um, at, the, at the chip level has gotten significant amount of attention is actually protecting IPs against, um, against piracy using logic locking or logic obfuscation. The idea behind this is quite simple. However, the implementation proven to be very, very challenging and difficult. The idea is that we're going to lock the circuit by injecting a number of key gates inside the circuit. And the key, the correct key can go into a tamper-proof memory. Now, this particular chip, when it is fabricated, it is fabricated in an untrusted foundry. But the chip is not functional because it doesn't have the key. The chip comes back into a trusted facility, let's say in US, US soil, and then this trusted facility is able to enter the right key so that the chip becomes functional. When the chip becomes functional, that means the chip is unlocked. That means the chip can function the way it is meant to be. And the key is supposedly sitting in a tamper-proof memory. So this is all good. Nice idea, interesting to protect, interesting way of protecting our designs against, let's say, untrusted foundry that can pretty much see everything. If you give your design to a foundry, and there's no key in it, there's no protection in it. They can give you the chip you want, but they, boy, they can easily steal that design and go and make anything else they want with it. So this is good, but there are challenges. Tamper-proof memory, is it really tamper-proof? We've proven that it's not because we have capabilities within the Fix Institute at the University of Florida that we're able to actually look beyond the, the package, uh, inside the package. And we're able to actually look into every, every memory cell and, be, and, and read the content of that memory. What about the bus that carries that uh, key to a, let's say, register block? What about the register block itself? What about the bus that takes it to the locking gates? What about test and debug infrastructure that exists on the chip? So as you can imagine, there's a number of actually ways we could attack it. When we say we could attack it, we actually did. I'm going to show you some of the attack earlier, later, that to show you how we're able to extract the secrets. But as you can see, it's a multifaceted problem. Design, protecting an IP is not an easy task. But protecting IP is a must because IP is where we invested over almost entire R&D money 
to be able to design an IP, and the IP is where the money is generated for U.S. businesses and curious jobs. How do we address that? How do we develop a technique that can deal with it? There's a number of attacks, whether we call them SAL attacks, which is purely software-based, or uh, 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 solutions, sensor-based solutions, and so on and so forth that we need to develop to address. So we came up with a concept called the defense in depth. Actually, this concept is not new. Within IT security, this concept has been used for the past couple of decades, where basically build the defense on a number of layers, where these layers are completely independent. When an attacker is able to get through one, has to face a new layer of defense that is very different than the previous one. It increases the complexity so much that hoping that the attacker will move away from carrying that attack eventually successfully. We take a lesson from that and establish this concept of defense in depth for protecting logic locking and obfuscation through seven, uh, six uh, different layers. So the goal is to be able to protect the key inside the chip. So well, how do we go about doing that? We could, first, we need to make sure that we lock the function of the chip. Second, we need to make sure we lock the scan or test infrastructure. Once we do that, we need to also protect it against all sorts of physical attacks. In our lab, we do quite a bit of probing and fib attack, which basically we can look into every location inside the chip. This is destructive. However, we do have a capability that we're able also to um, non-destructively, non-intrusively, be able to attack, be able to attack um, the chip and read the content of the chip, which I'm going to share with you uh, very briefly. And, in, and first and most important defense that has to go inside the chip is that if the chip is becoming a target of malicious change by the untrusted boundary. And if you wanna verify whether our chip is attacked or not, we go backward. We start by looking at the chip inside the chip to see if the chip actually has malicious change or Trojan in it. Because the easiest way that attacker can steal your key is to put a Trojan inside your chip and be able to read the key very easy out of the chip. Second step is for us to see if there is a contactless way for the attacker to attack the chip. Then we go to probing. Then we verify the scan is protected. Then we verify our function is protected. That means our key will never basically be able to be exposed to the attacker. Which is still there, we have to make sure that memory that is still stored the key also is protected. And I'll show you what we were able to do, unfortunately, on existing devices. Among those layers, let me just talk about the top layer because I am, unfortunately, I won't have enough time to go through all of those layers and share with you some of the attacks that we can carry out as well for the purpose of um, device and system assessment. First layer basically in this more defense in depth approach that I shared with you focuses on uh, protecting IP against malicious change. In this case, our focus is on untrusted function, which means the design is made within a trusted facility or trusted entity in the United States. Design is made by Cisco, Qualcomm, Intel, or government agencies such as AFRL and Navy. And but the foundry doesn't exist, therefore goes into an untrusted foundry. Once the chip is fabricated, the chips come back to a trusted facility just to verify whether this chip that was fabricated in a, by using a, a state-of-the-art technology, but in a untrusted foundry, is actually trusted and has it been manipulated or not. So that, as, that facility from the standpoint of cost is much, much, much cheaper than fabrication facility. So assume this is doable. And this is actually a real problem that US government considers that to be addressed. So we can develop a console, we call them Trojan scanner. And in this case, we rely on imaging methods. I've been working on this particular problem since 2005, and I can tell you it's one of the most difficult problems that I had to deal with. Majority, if not all techniques, it have been developed so far to be able to test for Trojans in a complex chip proven to be very ineffective and inefficient. However, I'm a firm believer that using imaging technique, we can do, we can solve this problem. And how do we do that? This is a chip actually as a 
65 nanometer or 45 nanometer technology. We uh, do backside thinning. However, backside thinning is not necessary. Once you do untrusted foundry fabrication, you get access to the wafer, you can bring the wafer back to the United States and be able to verify it. So this step could be, could be, could be skipped, but at this point, we did not have access to the wafer, therefore we focused on a chip. We had to remove the backside of the chip. Then we start taking images using SIM machine. We do all sorts of image processing and image enhancement. We assume that we have the layout of the chip and then we do a comparison. So again, the concept sounds very simple. However, the actual implementation is quite difficult because SIM images come with extreme amount of noise. And if you want to eliminate those noise and be able to, um, get high quality images from a one centimeter by one centimeter chip, those images may take about 45 days. Our goal is to finish everything within 10 hours. Therefore, we have to take low quality images. And that requires significant amount of image processing and image enhancement, and then comparison with layout, considering that you're looking for maybe one transistor being added or one wire maybe 10 in a sub 22 nanometer technology is extremely difficult task to be able to achieve that. We have very interesting results. Unfortunately, I won't be able to share with you, but I just wanna share with you the basic concept behind it. The next step in the establishing that hardware root of trust is protecting assets. We could design, we could design the most expensive front door to protect you against attackers, but we have a very easy way to get to a backdoor into your system. And that's, a, that's how, unfortunately, majority of assets, whether it's key sensitive information, configuration bits, are happen to be vulnerable because as a designer, we're not always able to figure out what are all the different ways an attacker can find their way into our system. And there might be that easy way that we never thought about it, an attacker gets his way into the system. So let me show you with you some of the work that we do in that regard to ensure that the devices and systems that we evaluate, the evaluation goes back to the companies that we work with to show them that we at our lab were able to break into it. Therefore, an entity with similar or greater capabilities, they would be even easier to break into the systems. So we normally do a lot of uh, software-based attacks within the Institute, but I wanna share with you what we do with you know, some of our capabilities uh, using uh, uh, interesting instruments that we have. Uh, Front-side attack and back-side attack, we take the chip and then non-intrusively using uh, photo animation capabilities using how much so famous 1000, we're able to actually look inside the chip and break into it. So let me share with you one, one, one of those scenarios. This is an FPGA. Kintec 7, it's a development board um, from Synopsys and a uh, uh, bit stream encrypted that goes into a non-volatile memory. And from there, um, the uh, encrypted bit stream goes inside the FPGA. There's an AES decryptor that takes the key from the battery backed uh, uh, memory and uh, the keys applied to AES decryptor and bit stream is decrypted. Now there are two scenarios that you can you can think of to attack the system. One is to be able to get the key. Once you get the key, then you can basically decrypt this bit stream that is easy readable from here, which is outside the VGA. The second scenario is to let the decryption happen and then read the output bus connected to AES. So let's talk about the second scenario first. This technique is non-destructive, non-destructive, non-invasive, and there's no footprint on the chip after you apply FAMOS 1000 because there's no damage to the chip whatsoever. So I'll show you a step-by-step -step process. This is an image of a Xilinx Kintec 7 in a flip chip package. Flip chip packaging allows you to be able to have access to the backside of the chip easily. Next, we take, the, we take an image of the chip with very high resolution using a laser uh, infrared laser scanning microscopy that's part of the photon emission capability. And you could see that the repeated areas, those repeated areas are actually um, configurable logic blocks. We're looking for the areas inside the chip that the AES exists. So AES is not a lookup table based implementation, which means that we're looking for random logic. So after uh, looking around a bit, which is not difficult, um, to find this area, this seems a random logic where a bunch of gates, you can see thousands and thousands of gates holding over here and over here. 
We expect two areas that are considered to be random logic. One would be the um, uh, where the AES circuitry is to perform decryption and encryption. And the second one is what we call a main core. Main core is where the configurable logic comes in and then it decides which lookup table basically we have to go and place in. So how do we get to know which is which? To find out, we use a trick. We are first actually putting an unencrypted bitstream inside non-volatile memory. When there is no encryption, there is no need for AES to be involved. So we put an um, unencrypted bitstream we run it through FPGA, FPGA under photon emission capability. Once the switching activity start to appear inside the circuit, they're going to be captured by the machine. And as you can see, the activity is over here. When there's no encryption, this must be the main core. So our guess is that this must be the AES core. Well, let's test it out. How do we do that? Well, why don't we now this time put in a encrypted bitstream inside the FPGA? By putting an encrypted bitstream inside the FPGA, the area that is supposed to be AES is start to light up. And now we know that this is where AES circuitry is. If this is where the decryption happened, there must be a bus that connects this AES to main core and then from there goes to all lookup tables so that this, con this bitstream can be configured within those lookup tables. By looking a bit further, we find the bus, as you can see, as AES is decrypting the as AES is decrypting the um, in, uh, encrypted bitstream, you could see the bus is actually transferring the information. Depending on the content of the bus, whether it's one or zero, we're able to actually read that content easily. So even if you may have a tamper-proof memory, no problem, we can read the AES. This information obviously was, was communicated back to the sponsors, make sure they are aware of this vulnerability. The second scenario, as I mentioned to you earlier, is what if we go and attack the key itself, right? So this is, a, uh, a, again, a, an FPGA board from um, uh, Xilinx. And in this case, the objective was to look into a battery back RAM and be able to read it. Unfortunately, I have to uh, skip the details, but believe me, uh, we broke into it. Why? Because here is the key. This is the key that we extracted from the battery back memory. And we use this key to be able to decrypt the encrypted bitstream in this non-volatile memory. Now getting access to the bitstream is extremely easy. In fact, it's readily available for you to read it through this because this is part of a PCB and this connection is already available for you to be able to monitor. So, um, the, so we, we continued this by attacking the logic locking that I mentioned to you earlier. When the key goes to registers inside the circuit, then um, logic locking would be able to, we would be able to look into that, um, that, that those registers and read them out. So what do we do this time? We chose a different FPGA. We focused on micro semi polar fire. This is the FPGA in a Philip chip package. And again, top of the chip is easily available completely non-destructive. The entire process is done in two hours from uh, putting the system into the machine, uh, looking into the areas to find out where the key is transferring so that we would be able to extract those, those, those keys. So this is the image of the uh, device with the laser scanning microscopy. As we dig deeper, we are able to actually identify lookup tables and the registers within lookup tables. Now the registers that are used to transfer the key. These registers are part of the Buddha process. We may have hundreds of thousands of registers and flip-flops inside the circuit, but that the ones that we're concerned about are the ones that at the beginning key has to transfer. Therefore, those are the registers. If you turn on and off your chip multiple times, you will find that only few registers, they light up all the time. And that's the way we were able to actually identify those registers. And let me show you, this is a content of registers that carry the key. We find every action, the way microsemi is designed their FPGA, each lookup table gets two flip-flops. So you could see, we can actually find all combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 combinations within the flip-flops that we have. And that's how we're able to actually break into logic locking as well. Now, obviously for us, the lessons learned, we uh, develop countermeasures. How do we go about addressing this? Unfortunately, again, I won't be able to share how what the countermeasures look like, but carrying these attacks give a significant amount of insight as why these, these, these vulnerabilities exist that allows us to be able to develop 
new sets of flip-flops, new sets of gates, new sets of technologies, and new sets of sensors to be able to protect these devices against this sort of attacks. One actually a very interesting way we try to uh, protect it is this concept called nano pyramid, where we're able to actually uh, the, uh, protect them against the reflection of the light that goes inside the chip. Nano pyramid is not a new concept. It's been used in solar systems to be able to capture the most amount of sunlight so that they absorb the most amount of energy. But obviously that's done at a different scale. Where we're here, we're looking at uh, to be done at nano scale. That, and that layer, which is called nano pyramid, sits between the active layer and middle one. Once an uh, attacker shines the light into the chip, the, um, the nano pyramid is going to reflect the light randomly so that it's unclear to the attacker what the response actually was. In this case, when there is no nano uh, pyramid, once the laser beam is applied, the response of one transistor can come back. Well, in this case, when nano pyramid exists, the response of multiple transistors come in, so it just makes it confusing for the attacker to be able to see whether the response was a one or a zero. Another technology, we call them internal shading, where in this case, for somebody to be able to probe inside your chip to read the secret, the internal shielding protect you against it by ensuring that one of the added um, interconnects around the sensitive areas have to be broken before somebody could get to the secret. But what happens is that during the boot up process, the chip tests itself. So these interconnects will be tested. And the moment chip knows that something has been attacked, it can actually have a payload that can erase all sensitive information. That's how you could be protected from this sort of attacks. Now, majority of my discussions so far have focused on integrated circuits. Let me also briefly talk about the attacks at PCB level, which unfortunately attacks at the PCB level are, are more pervasive because it's easier to carry. PCBs are basically um, uh, can be easily attacked physically. They're uh, compared to integrated circuit where they carry now millions and billions of uh, transistors. They carry tens of uh, thousands of uh, components. Um, the front side and back side of PCB are easily available for you to be able to probe into and so on and so forth. So uh, what's the issue? Remember the Bloomberg story? that to be um, proven that, uh, that, that uh, there was a malicious uh, chip hidden inside the chip. Well, one way to address that is to establish an external visual inspection. Somebody with their own camera or maybe more sophisticated optical microscopy can take image of the PCB from both sides using image processing. Then you identify every component inside that PCB. You generate a bill of material you compare with the original and golden bill of material, and you will be able to verify that there is no extra component inside the PCB, or at least on the boot surface level. Of course, you, when you do the image, image of the chip, you could do additional analysis. For example, you could do all sorts of defect analysis and reliability analysis, because if the solders are not done well, images can actually, and you can take the images and don't perform finite elemental analysis to be able to prove that the soldering may actually have resistive opens and shorts, et cetera, right? Again, the concept makes sense, it's easy, but unfortunately, when it comes to performing image processing and identifying every component, understanding that there are tens of different types of resistors and capacitors and chips, et cetera, it makes it very, very difficult problem. Today, we are doing very well when it comes to getting majority of the chips out and majority of the capacitances out. However, our confidence level with extracting the bill of material is not 100% yet. So it's a work, work of progress in the Institute. The Bloomberg story also showed that scenarios where the attacker were attackers were able to actually inject the children in between the layers of the PCB. So how do we protect that? Well, we do have capabilities called, uh, which is based on X-ray tomography that allows us to be able to, by changing the field of view, we can go actually in between the layers and create the slices of the PCB. Everything is done non-destructively and built the uh, PCB layer by layer by looking inside the layers, we will be able to identify whether any change has been made. This one actually has been done within the Institute. This is a Xilinx a Spartan 3 or 6 FPGA, where you could see that every layer of the PCB has been uh, extracted. And uh, by looking at those layers, if you're a bad guy, unfortunately, you would be able to copy the system. If you're a good guy, you could use this technology to um, be able to 
um, verify the authenticity as well as um, uh, authenticity of the system and ensure that there's no malicious implant within the system that you have designed. Okay, in the Vivo did this work in 2014. The Bloomberg story came in 2018. When this story came out, well, basically my phone couldn't stop ringing because everybody was looking for a solution like this to address it. In summary, establishing roots of trust is quite a challenge. As I, as I presented some of the challenges throughout this presentation, that it, it, it does need significant amount of investment. This has been a topic area that you have not the community has not been spending much time over the past decade or two decades when things have been moving quite a bit offshore. And then now we realize that this is an important problem. We need to find a way to establish huge of trust. And there's no silver bullet. We have to look at this uh, from the different aspect, uh, whether it's chip level, feasible level, and throughout the life cycle. So a multi-layer approach is absolutely, in my opinion, necessary. Design should take into consideration life cycle. Just because we design the secure chip doesn't necessarily mean that this chip is going to last for the next 20 years completely secure. Remember the attackers constantly get sophisticated, more educated, and come up with new and and interesting ways to unfortunately break into our system. So we need to keep that in mind. Device to system authentication, where we need to get the devices secure, then PCB secure, then system secure, and system of system secure. And finally, we need to protect the IPs and assets. Even a chip today has 10 different, 50 different IP cores and make sure that every one of them are trusted and asset that goes inside the chip is trusted to ensure that um, hardware of trust becomes available. So that ends my presentation.